Hey, Josh, what's the best way to deal with a breakup? Oh, I love it. Also, I am playing uh, solo self-found. And when I say I love it for the breakup, I mean that I love having a serious question we can get into. I don't know the fact that you have broken up. Let's talk about this, guys. What is the best way to deal with a breakup? Well, obviously, the best way to get over someone is to get under someone else. We know that. But if you want to talk about how to actually deal with it, if two people want to go through their lives together, then those two people need to gel together. They need to work together. They need to be you know, complementary to each other's lives. If you're breaking up, what you're effectively saying is that right now who you are is not complementing who I am. And that's not necessarily a slight on either of you. I might pick up a sword in this game that's really good for a, you know, ice build, but I've got a flaming skull build. Doesn't mean the sword's bad. Doesn't mean I'm bad. It means that if you put what we both bring to the table together, it doesn't enhance to create something better. So one of the best ways to deal with a breakup is to work out what you bring to the table and how you can make that better and then work out why you didn't work. What was it that was the mistake? What was not complementing the other side? And sometimes you'll sit back and you'll say, you know what, there was no one in the wrong here. We both did our best. We're both good people. We just don't complement with the builds that we've got right now. Sometimes you'll sit back and go, actually, I could have done this better. You could have done that better. We could have done this better. And that's absolutely fine. That works as well. But I think introspection is one of the best things you can do. Just introspections, man. Ask yourself, why did this or did this not work? Because I've met people and they say every single ex they have is crazy. Oh, all of my exes are crazy. Okay, well, the, um, the, the consistent thing here is you. So have you maybe not victim blaming? But have you kind of looked inside? Have you self-reflected? With this because if every single person you date is crazy you've either got terrible taste or you are trying to force your style to work with another style that you might find attractive but doesn't work and that's the the honest way of looking at that because you can be attracted to certain traits that you know that you actually don't work well with and yes, we are still talking about Path of Exile, straight up. I mean, the the Path of Exile build is very similar to a, a full-on relationship. As in, you can find things that work, you can find things that don't work, or you can just be solo. And everything is your fault. That works too. Because I, I have a very strong opinions about dating. And the reason I have strong opinions about dating is because... When I was working in schools for so long, so many young boys follow the advice of absolute shitheads like Andrew Tate. And unfortunately, they are the, the role models that young kids look up to. They are the people that scared, naive, um, worried, impressionable people look up to and they think that is the paragon of being a man that is the paragon of virtue that is an admirable quality to have in a human being and i don't believe it is they are angry they are scared and what they are looking for is an answer they're looking for someone to tell them that they are not wrong the world is they should scare the world into working with them they should beat the world into their way of thinking when the actual truth is, most people haven't got a clue what's going on, and that's totally okay. How Andrew Tate became a role model is beyond me. Unfortunately, and this is the crazy thing, it's not beyond you. It just, you need to accept that people are scared. They really are. I mean, most people have no idea what their place is in the world. Most people have no idea how to talk to people they find attractive. Most people are socially anxious. Most people don't believe that they're anywhere near the level of kind of financial independence that they want to be or should be or deserve to be. People believe the world owes them stuff. And when you don't get your way, it's very hard to say this is my fault. But when someone comes along and says, hey, it's not your fault, it's everyone else's fault, that's comfortable. Most people will prefer a beautiful lie over an uncomfortable truth. And when the beautiful lie is telling someone that 
Nothing is your fault. You are perfect as you are. The world needs to adapt to you. Then you're going to convince a hell of a lot of people to follow your way of thinking, which sucks. It really does suck. And this is why I've got such strong opinions about it, because I've seen so many people in schools, in colleges, in universities be convinced by effectively emotional charlatans that you need to trick people into liking you. You need to emotionally manipulate the people in your life into believing you are certain ways or you're doing this. I mean, I've had people, I've had female friends who have unfortunately had many encounters with guys, you know, pickup artists and whatnot, try all their techniques out and they never work. And I've even had people say to me before, you know, get your woman under control. What are you on about? I don't control anyone. I'm with people as friends, as relationships, as, you know, professional partners. I'm with people. I spend time with people because I value how that person sees the world and I believe they bring positivity to my life in general. Now, I'm not saying be toxically positive. You know, we don't want toxic positivity. Not everything is happy, shiny roses all the time. There are times when you need to sit down and have serious heart-to-heart -heart conversations about negative things. But, and this is very important, while the process of talking to someone about things that scare you or worry you may be painful, it is not destructive. That's a great line. And I didn't come up with that. I believe that was, I stole that from a song by the band The Flowbots. I believe the song is called Anne Braden, and it's a fantastic song about one of the first women in America back in, I want to say, the 1930s that really stood up against segregation. It was a fantastic song, but she said, while this is a very painful process, it is not destructive. So this comes back to the whole dating advice thing. question you need to ask and this is really this is the people say you know how can i get someone to date me and i think that's the wrong question the question should be how do i become someone worth dating because that way you're putting the onus onto you you're not saying hey i'm going to trick someone you're saying right how do i how do i improve how do i be this person my pc crashed and i missed the first part of the dating thing can i get to so someone said can you explain dating in the terms of mmorpgs of course i can you can be the greatest tank ever. You can have the highest physical defense, but if the boss you're facing uses magic, you're not going to be much good. It doesn't mean that you're not a good tank. It means that you aren't prepared for this specific situation. So maybe don't try and force yourself into a group that only goes to kill that boss. You can find other groups that will work with you better. Okay, so dating in like an MMORPG terms, everyone wants to be a DPS. You have got influential men who are claiming that women only value and respect DPS. Women need more DPS. If you aren't doing as much DPS as every other man, you are a worthless man. Forgetting that actually, we kind of need more healers. And they're kind of always wanted. They're always needed. They don't always get the glory that the DPS gets. But sometimes you want to rock around with a healer instead. Instant healer cues, man. Instant healer cues. And what role am I? I am definitely a support bard. Without a doubt. And I think... The great thing about being a support bard is I'm the kind of class where people go, Sorry, Josh. This is a very small party. We only need people who have got very specific skills. And I'll go, I get it. But when they've got, Okay, you know what? We've now got a few free spaces then you can take me and then at the end people go oh yeah that was actually really easy because of all the buffs that you gave us that's pretty much what it is just just buffing everyone else that's what you've got to do you don't need to be a tank a damage dealer or a healer find someone that's really good at doing that and then just big them up so they get even better at doing it that makes me happy so we were talking about the whole dating thing and i really do think that there is a a horrible reality in, in schools and colleges where so many people don't just talk to each other. They just don't communicate. It's so many problems can be solved with a you know, brief, honest, genuine 
chat, but people are scared. There's a great article on Cracked, back when Cracked was funny, and I reread it every year, and I think it was uh, six harsh truths that will make you a better person. And if you haven't read that article, I would definitely recommend you go and read it. Because after reading it, you either res kind of respond to it like, oh my god, that's awful, that's not about me, that's terrible, why would they say this about people? Or you reread it and you're like, yeah, I've learned from that, I've improved. And I have definitely Im improved. I was, I was lacking in areas. I read that article, it put a lot of stuff into in kind of perspective for me. And I reread it every year, because I think it's a great article. But one of them was just the notion that who you are in your own head is different to who other people see you being in real life. We judge other people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. So as long as we intended to do something good, we are, in our heads, good. If somebody else intended to do something good but ends up doing something bad, they are, in our view, bad. Because intention doesn't matter when it comes to other people. Intention only matters when it's in relation to ourselves. Which is a real shame. People can't get over that. It's... This manifests itself most often in the famous phrase, but I'm a nice guy. If only she would give me a chance. I'm a nice guy. Okay, well done for meeting the bare minimum. Unfortunately, you don't get a medal for that. Whether you are a nice guy or not is actually not up to you to say. Or decide. I don't understand. Please use MMORPG terms. I'm a world-class raider. Are you in a world-class raid group? No. But I could be. That's the MMO term for that. You don't get to decide whether you're a nice guy or not. What you have to do is treat people nicely and other people will say this about you. And then it becomes a part of you and then people know that about you. That's what it is. And what this is linking back to, as far as um, actions go, is we are seeing a great increase in the amount of people who very much believe that they need to say they are things instead of just being things. I mean, yeah, a man who has to say, I am a world-class raider, is no world-class raider. I mean, Steven Seagal goes around bragging that he is a fantastic martial artist. I don't think Bruce Lee did too much of that. Uh, and I think Bruce Lee would win in a fight against Steven Seagal. Um, and that's just me saying that. I think I would probably win in a fight against Steven Seagal. I think a, a, a slight incline at this point in time would probably win in a fight against Steven Seagal. But when you meet people who just go around talking about how amazing and fantastic and brilliant and incredible they are, or how much of a manly man they are, you tend to realise they aren't. What did I just tune into? Uh, mostly bashing Steven Seagal, but also some Path of Exile. Kind of on the side. This is a stream that very much kind of walks that thin line between life advice and just taking the piss out of pop culture. It's an interesting one. It's a very interesting one. And I enjoy being on that kind of razor's edge. You never quite know where we're going to go with this. I don't care about others' opinions, but I am a god. I love it. That attitude in the chat, fantastic. That is very, very Dennis energy from Always Sunny, which is one of the best shows ever written and is about terrible people. I had a friend of mine say, I don't like the show. None of the characters are likable. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of the point. It's You're not meant to like these people. You're meant to hate them and watch them fail, which is very cathartic. So what we're talking about, I mean, you guys might have different experience to me, different opinions to me, that kind of stuff. And you might believe that I'm just completely talking up my ass and I'm wrong about all this because 
and it's been at least you know, one or two years since I've been in a school to teach or a college to teach. Hopefully that has changed. What I saw back when I was teaching was a lot of kids are much more accepting of people's differences than they were before, but they're also much easier to manipulate in terms of who they think they should be. That kind of stuff. And this is mostly the whole kind of uh, the manosphere thing, which is so weird. Uh, to me, that's very strange. What age are the kids I was teaching? See, I've I've taught from infants all the way up to, you know, semi-pro touring university level kind of acting stuff. I think that, yeah, Zoomers, if we're going to refer to them that, makes me feel very millennial, is Zoomers are fantastic at making people feel involved and making people feel you know, safe and inclusive, that kind of stuff. But I feel that we have lost a level of something there. And I think what we've lost is a level of being willing to challenge people when they are uncomfortable. And I don't mean, you know, traumatic levels of challenge, but I mean not accepting that something that scares you doesn't need to scare you forever. If you find something difficult, if you find something scary, if you find something hard to do, don't ignore it. Don't run away. Don't protect yourself. Don't insulate yourself from it forever. Find a way to take it on in a safe, controlled, and you know, productive manner. Because some people will say, there is, there's got to be a lovely middle ground between saying, I can't swim, therefore I'm never going to swim, and saying to someone, I can't swim, and them just pushing you in the deep end of the pool and being like, sink or swim, you're going to learn now. Because one of them, you avoid the problem forever, and you never get better at it. And one of them, you take on the problem way too much in one go, and it scares you even more because you don't know what to do. And swimming is an example I use a lot about talking about improving life in general. Because no matter how many books you read on how to swim, no matter how much theory you know about how to swim, the moment you jump in the water and it's cold and wet and some of it goes up your nose and you start to choke and you start to cough and you flail around and suddenly your clothes, if you're still wearing them, are a hell of a lot heavier than you expected them to be and your eyes start stinging. The theory cannot prepare you for the practical that you will undergo when you try and take this on. So there needs to be a lovely middle ground between avoiding something forever because it scares you and taking something on with, you know, way too much speed and way too much energy without being prepared. But there also needs to be a level of understanding that when you theoretically understand something, you might not practically understand something because intelligence is being book smart and wisdom is knowing how to apply that intelligence to stuff in ways that actually make practical differences. So one thing that I think that the, and this all links back to the school system, I believe that many, many, many years ago, the school system was way too in favour of just throwing people into situations that were scary, traumatic, and didn't actually teach them stuff, because the teachers had this very, well, that's how I learned mentality. If, you know, all the kind of boomer adults had the, well, I struggled, so you have to struggle kind of mentality, which does not teach everyone everything. It's not always productive. But then we go too far the other way, which is, oh, that scares you, that worries you, it's okay, I will insulate you from it forever and you will never have to take it on and you'll never deal with it. Because I believe that's actually the origin story of uh, some part of Buddhism, which is the story of Siddhartha, uh, how they were effectively insulated from any level of pain and suffering in life ever. And the first time they ever actually saw a flower dying, they didn't understand that life had an, an end. Uh, and that, was, that scared them so much, they started meditating on that kind of stuff but there very much needs to be a balance between throwing people into dangerous situations to teach them about it and coddling people away from dangerous situations so they never learn to get better at it some people think that failing is the worst thing in the world and i believe this is a fault mostly and i'm gonna make some enemies here i believe this is mostly a fault of parents who do not want their precious little angels to ever fail. You cannot fail this person. It, they've got anxiety. They cannot fail. Okay, well, I've been a teacher before. I've read through anxiety reports. I've read through all of the extracurricular stuff we have to put people on. And actually, exposure to failure 
is one of the best ways to slowly normalize this as a part of life and is one of the best ways to alleviate that anxiety when people realize that actually if you're scared of something but you never experience it you build this thing up in your mind to be an unreal nightmare a creature an absolute behemoth of a problem but when you experience it and you're thinking well that was it that was all it was okay cool now i can just move on i failed way more times than i've ever attempted anything if you build something up humans are scared of what they don't understand they're scared of what they don't know you don't need to put a creature in the dark you just need to put someone in the dark and wait for them to imagine a creature because that is way worse than anything you could ever put there it's why the best part of alien at the first film is when you don't see the alien so kids and parents encouraging these kids think that the concept of failure is so bad that it must never ever be experienced and therefore the kids start to see failure as the worst thing they don't even understand what failure means they think that if you have failed at something you are the world's worst person when actually it's just i mean there was that old cheesy poster fail first attempt in learning that kind of stuff but actually failure is just a process just part of the process that you go through it's i mean thomas edison famously said i didn't fail i just found a hundred ways that didn't work and he said this after stealing most of the work from nikola tesla so he's probably not the best example to use in this but most people don't know too much about that whole situation you know the reason that parents annoy me with this is i've had conversations with parents before and they've said oh you said that my child failed i'm like yeah they did I'm like, well that's not acceptable i'm like what do, do you want me to say they succeeded when they didn't and they're like yes i'm like okay so you care more about their emotional state being coddled than actually teaching them the skills to exist in this world and unfortunately yeah that's exactly what they care about what do I think of today's dating culture and how it affects young people mentally? Ooh, we'll be getting back into that chat because I do like that chat. We can get back to that chat. I think that it's gone too far the wrong way. And by that, I mean, I have had people say to me, oh, back in my day, if something was broken, you fixed it. I'm like, okay. But you can understand that what that also means is you refuse to ever admit that the break is a systemic issue that is stemming from fundamental incompatibility. You're trying to force two jigsaw pieces here that don't work. That's what you're trying to do. You're, you're effectively trying to, I mean, this is from a dating point of view, you're trying to force a relationship to happen when it shouldn't because your options are just so low, so few. You're making this happen. That's why people say, oh, you know, many, many years ago, people stayed together. I'm like, yeah, and we've heard all the horror stories of how terrible those relationships used to be. You, every now and again, get a group of grandparents who have been together 50, 60, 70 years, madly in love, everything's perfect. But they are nowhere near as frequent as oh yeah this couple have been together for ages and they hate each other i mean there's that old kind of boomer mentality of wife bad and i think it's really weird that that became a sense of humor like where did that stem from hating the person that you love and want to spend your life with is now a really funny thing it's i get the humor i don't understand why it was so popular with everyone why everyone can be like oh yeah I hate my wife too. Why did you marry them then? But now we've also got this throwaway culture, which is as soon as there is any issue at all, you then don't need to address it. You just throw throw the whole person away and move on. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm compatible with this person. We're getting on. We've had a date or two. We really like it. Oh, hang on. We've found something now that we don't like about each other we don't agree with is this a fundamentally incompatible thing that we can't change if so yes maybe the relationship should not continue if it's one of those things where actually this is a deal breaker that's totally understandable you know break the deal but what i think's happened is people have come to see the most insignificant shit as deal breakers people have come to see 
oh, this person does not mean... I've legitimately had people say, I can't keep dating that person. They didn't find The Office funny. Okay, I mean, you, you don't need to like the same TV shows as someone else. You can find a level of compatibility with someone. I freaking love Star Trek. Star Trek The Next Generation, one of my absolute favorite shows. I think it's fantastic. I love The Next Gen. I've got friends that don't like Star Trek. I'm not going to stop being friends with them because they don't like Star Trek. I love Star Trek. They don't. That's fine. I also like Battlestar Galactica. I've never seen Babylon 5 or Babylon, um, Babylon 9, isn't it? I've never seen too much Stargate. I've never seen... I haven't yet seen Star Trek Voyager. But I want to. And these are processes I want to go through. I've had people... I've had friends I know who have broken up because you know, they don't like the way that someone eats their toast. They've had people that have broken up because they leave the bedroom in a messy way. They leave clothes around the place. I'm like, okay, hang on. You could just sit down and talk about this. You could express your opinions, your views in a healthy, respectful way and both become better people for each other. That could work. Or you could do, unfortunately, what a lot of people seem to be doing. And again, if this is just my boomer millennial mentality being like, ooh, modern bad, I understand. But I have seen an up, kind of an uptake, an increase in people throwing away the whole thing because a small part doesn't work. And like I said, if that small part is a major deal breaker, understandable. But I've seen this happen when that small part should not have been a major deal breaker. I mean, sometimes people just make excuses. And one of the big things is ghosting. Oh, I went on a date, it went bad, I'm going to ghost that person. Okay, if you've got, like, legitimate safety concerns, you don't want to talk to that person again, you think ghosting them is the best idea, go for it. But if it's not a safety concern, if it's just a we didn't vibe, then that person should have enough respect to understand the hey, had a nice time, but I wasn't feeling the vibe, all the best kind of conversation. That works as well. And... You know what, sometimes it can even be a good idea to have that conversation with someone, and if they respond badly, ooh, you've dodged a bullet. Straight away. Nothing perfect exists, but between Instagram filters and TikTok demanding perfection from everyone, if something isn't perfect for you or for someone else that you know or love or you know, care about, the attitude of it's not perfect, move on, sucks, man. It really does suck. A little bit more compassion and respect would go a long way. Flannel, that's a really good point. That's a really good point, but I believe those things are rarer than we would like them to be. Perfect. Perfection is the enemy of done. So, on one side, you've got the old boomer mentality of relationship bad, but force it to work anyway. And on one side, you've got the zoomer mentality of relationship not 100% perfect, throw it away, not even worth trying. There's got to be, again, a healthy middle. A healthy middle of, it doesn't need to be perfect, but it needs to be compatible on a fundamental level that you can then talk to and improve on and get better at. Went on a date with a girl who didn't want a second date because I didn't love the TV show Friends. You also have to ask, is that just an excuse they were giving to not go on the second date? Because if that is just an excuse, then we need to, as a society, become better at talking to people. But at the same time, there are elements of friends that I find really funny. You know, people will hate me for this. It's become really popular to just hate friends. I think there's actually some parts of it, of that show, that are really funny. I think some parts are really well written, really well acted, really well filmed. Is it a perfect show? No. Because it's not It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which is, in my mind, one of the funniest, best acted, best written, best film TV shows of all time. But I've got friends who absolutely hate It's Always Sunny. And it doesn't make me any less, you know, friends with them at all. Friends was very much a product of its time. Friends was a product of mid to late 90s humour. It was. Introduced my girlfriend to Sunny last year. First season, hated it. Okay, man. First season of Always Sunny is not good. The same way that I don't show people the first season of The Office if I want to introduce them to it. It's just not good. And 
I think that the uh, season two onwards of Always Sunny is when they start to find their groove. You know, season three or four on, that's when it gets good. If the first season isn't good, though, why should we have to watch through that? Same as a game that gets good 10... You know what? I completely agree, which is why I just skip it. If the first season isn't good, you should not need to be forced to slog through it for the second, third, fourth, or fifth to make sense. So instead, if you can just start at the second, third, fourth, or fifth, where it gets good, as long as the show gives you enough context to be a good onboarding point for new viewers, but also enough callbacks to be a good reference point for old viewers, that's great. That's the way to do it. It's You've got to find this really difficult balance between being an onboarding point and being a continuation. 